On August 19, 1966, six men were climbing an enormous glacier between two peaks in Chamonix, France. The glacier, Mer de Glace, translates to Sea of Ice. It stretched all the way to Mont Blanc, but the crew's goal today wasn't the famous mountain. Instead, they were there to traverse one of the most challenging climbs in the world, Petit Drou. The peak's north face is one of the six great faces in the Alps, and just 15 years before their expedition, had never been climbed before. It was 3 a.m., so darkness clouded the face of the peak, leaving the group blind. Rain spat down from the heavens, leaving the men soaked and chilling their bones. They carried heavy sacks filled with ropes, batons, army rations, and sleeping bags. An American, two Germans, an Englishman, and two Frenchmen made up the group with some meeting for the first time in a cheap hotel the previous night. Although they were there to scale Petit Drew in the dark and heavy rain, they weren't there to reach the summit. The group was assembled because two young Germans were stuck on a ledge somewhere on the wall, unable to retreat, unable to continue climbing. After all, a thin layer of ice covered the wall due to the freezing rain. A helicopter had confirmed the two men were still alive just two days prior, but they were running out of time. Gary Hemming, the sole American on the glacier, would push the men forward under challenging conditions. He had a conviction about him that in turn carried the other five soaked climbers upwards. Today, Gary was just a great climber from California, but in a few days, he would become one of the most famous people in Europe. This is their story. Five days before Gary Hemming and his crew would climb Petit Drew, Heinz Ramisch and Hermann Schrittel had set out on the same route. Heinz, a 22-year-old student from Germany, had never climbed before with his 30-year-old auto mechanic partner Hermann. The duo was part of a larger group that had met at the campgrounds below the peak, but after camping together, they had decided to team up. Their goal? To complete the 3,730-meter rock and ice climb. Petit Drew. Petit Drew is the lower summit of the Grand Agui de Drew. A ridge connects both summits, and the peak is considered one of the most challenging climbs in the world. The north and west faces offer almost 3,000 feet of intense vertical climbing on rock and ice. The faces are nearly as tall as El Capitan in Yosemite, and it caught the eye of Alpinus early on, but it was never even considered possible until after World War I. In 1935, some of the best climbers in the world made the first attempt to scale the walls. And in 1952, the first attempts of the west face would take place. And the most challenging part was the 90-meter Deidre, a dihedral of granite high up on the face. The expedition was so impactful in the mountaineering community that one of the men on the climb would write a book about the endeavor. On their first attempt, the group of three would turn around after a 30-meter granite overhang presented itself to the exhausted group. The following year, they brought more equipment, and this time attacked the route from the north face, placing primitive bolts into the granite, allowing them to entirely skip the section of the west face that had stopped them the prior climb. To progress further, they would complete a 35-meter pendulum to the right, reaching a small but good ledge, and leaving a rope behind if they had to retreat. Then, they completed roughly nine more pitches of lesser difficulty before coming onto easier ground, completing the northwest ridge and eventually the summit. The pendulum that opened the route to the summit would eventually be named German's Ledge. At the time, this was considered the climb of the year, and was one of the significant accomplishments in the Alps, earning the name, the last great problem of the Alps. Today, the traditional route up the north and west faces has been destroyed by rock falls, but in 1966, the route was alive and attempted by anyone who wanted to achieve a challenging climb. But the 1950s expeditions didn't have to face something climbers in 1966 would. Incredibly bad weather. 
Hines and Herman made decent progress up the face on the first day. They planned to complete the route in two to three days the average time on the wall for most climbers. Because they planned to only be on the wall for a few days, they carried the minimum gear they would need for a two-man bivouac. This meant they could take a little more food, but would suffer in cold, wet weather. On August 15th, the second day of the expedition, Herman would be climbing a steep vertical wall when he slipped. He would fall over 30 feet before his rope and harness stopped the fall, but doing so, he badly bruised his ribs. His partner Hines was going through his own struggles as his throat was on fire for most of the day due to dehydration. At times, it would hurt so much that he had trouble swallowing, but despite all the duo's struggles, they continued to make progress up the wall. But that night, they would be tested. A thunderstorm would move into the area and rain on the climbers all night. On day three, the two climbers would start on the most challenging part of the climb, the dehedral. Although the rain had stopped, clouds were again forming overhead, and the intense cold had frozen the rain from the previous night, meaning the wall was now covered in a small sheet of slippery ice. This made impossibly slow progress in the wall. Herman would fall once again, and Hines would have to catch him using his hip belay. But in the process, he would cut both of his hands while trying to secure himself to the wall, causing blood to leak consistently through his fingers. After climbing for over seven hours, the duo had finished just 90 meters. They had committed to the pendulum, leaving them with two options. Number one, the bolt ladder established in 1952, which led to safety on the less complicated north face. Or number two, continuing up the horrible ice 30 meter overhang but that decision would be made for them. The duo quickly realized that number two was off the table, but as they prepared to traverse the bolt ladder, reality would slap them in the face. The ice on the wall had made it impossible for them to traverse the pitch safely. The duo stood on an exposed ledge just beneath the roofs, unable to commit to the overhang or bolt ladder, so they looked back the way they came but it was useless. Repelling back through the pendulum was more impossible than the other two options. Because of the weather and the inability to secure a line, they were stuck on a small ledge high up on the northwest face of one of the most challenging climbs in the world. Freezing rain pelted them as they attempted to set up their bivouac to make themselves comfortable. As soon as they were settled in, they removed their red parka and began waving it furiously over the edge, a signal agreed upon before the climb as a message for help. It took 24 hours before rescue operations were underway. The military school for high mountaineering would lead the rescue. Their plan was to send parties up the easiest route to the summit, the Voye Normale, where they would bivouac, then rappel down the north face to reach the two Germans. The only issue? The weather. Although groups of men were ready to make the climb, the weather conditions continued to worsen throughout the day, and by 3.30 p.m., when the rescue was supposed to start, it was nearly impossible for anyone to climb even the safest of routes. There was nothing anyone could do but wait. On August 18th, Gary Hemming was starting his day in a local cafe, reading the newspaper Dauphine Libere. His partner, Lothar Mao, sat across from him. Frustrated because the heavy rainfall outside had ruined their climbing plans for the day, Gary, a six foot four thin climber from Pasadena, California, was believed to be one of the best in the world. For Gary, as for others of his generation, alpinism was more than a crucible than a sport. He once told a reporter, The mountain is an initiation that is renewed every year. You go there, you test yourself, you find yourself again. Afterward, you are more able to accept yourself. Gary had made a name for himself in California, but his career would take off after he accepted a friend's invitation to Chamonix in 1960. His friend was John Harland, and together the two climbers brought their techniques perfected in Yosemite to the European Alps. The duo would set new routes on some of the most challenging mountains in the world, including a route on Petit Drew that would be named American Direct. But what they really became famous for was their high-altitude mountain rescues. They were part of some of the most essential mountaineering rescues of the 1960s. The only problem was that they were American and didn't fit in with the French mountaineering groups. The Americans disliked the French, and the French disliked the Americans. Even still, there was mutual respect. In 1966, John undertook an expedition on the Eiger with famous climbers, but this group 
didn't include Gary. On March 22nd, while climbing the murder wall, John's rope would snap and he would fall to his death. A journalist assigned to document the expedition would watch the ordeal through a telescope and his publication of the event would capture the hearts of the world media. People had a fascination with mountaineering, in particular, the dangers of mountaineering accidents. Five months later, Gary sat in a cafe eating breakfast while reading the paper. He was still recovering from losing his best friend, but he saw something that interested him. There were two German climbers stuck on a small ledge on the northwest route of Petit Drew. The paper had a detailed plan to rescue the two men, including multiple expeditions of over 40 people. Every newspaper in Western Europe carried details of the rescue on its front pages, in part because of the same interest caused by the accident that affected Gary so much. But as he continued to read, he noticed something. He thought that the rescue plan was impossible. The route Gary and John had created on the mountain connected to the northwest face at precisely where the climbers were stuck. Gary would look at his partner Lothair and state, if they do it like that, trying to go down from the top of the Drew, they may never get them out. Gary knew very well about the overhangs on the west face. It was almost a perfect coincidence. Gary had climbed the route before and was an experienced high altitude mountain rescuer. It didn't take long before the duo began making the short trip to the base of Petit Drew. By 3 p.m. that afternoon, they were already introducing themselves to the head of the rescue team, and that night, they would be sitting in a cheap hotel bar, putting together a team of climbers. The first was a young 22-year-old, Francois Guillou, who was the youngest mountain rescue official in the area and was known to be somewhat of a prodigy. Additionally, they would recruit Gerard Bauer, another young German who knew the two stranded climbers, Géo Baudin, a French guide, and Mick Burke, a talented Brit who had traversed the route before. At 7 p.m., the group of men was on the train headed up to the glacier, preparing to start their rescue climb. The men would set out on the Drew Coulard in the early morning hours. They carried heavy rucksacks and were soaking wet from the freezing rain. The couloir in good conditions is a challenging climb, but at 3 a.m. and in freezing rain, it was a death trap. In the sleet, the ledges and slabs were nearly impossible. The man attempted to traverse the first few pitches, but it was no use. They quickly realized they couldn't climb in the current conditions. It would set up their bivouacs for a few hours. In the morning, the rain had stopped and the group of six were greeted by two more climbers reaching them from below. A man named René de Maison, one of the best alpinists in France, and his photographer, Vincent Morsi. It made logical sense that the group of six would become a group of eight, but there was one slight problem. Gary disliked René because René worked for the French magazine Paris Match, which had covered John's death earlier in the year extensively and not in the best of light. Renee thought the group of six was moving too slowly and Gary thought Renee was only there for money. But at the end of the day, joining groups just made sense. So they put their personal differences aside and began climbing as one unit. The new group devised a plan of action. Gary and the young French prodigy Francois would go first, setting the trail. Rene and Vincent would follow them, and everyone else would bring up the group, carrying the bulk of the equipment. Gary would belay Francois as he furiously climbed his way up the west face. Without the young climber, the group would have been significantly slower up the vertical wall, and as they slowly made good progress on the peak in the town below, word had gotten out about a California man who was leading a rescue expedition, and the press loved it. On August 20th, three different groups were attempting to reach the Germans, and each one was getting closer. There were over 40 volunteers still working on the peak, while those on the summit were still trying to lower a steel cable down to the Germans. A group of four climbers on the north face were trying to climb from below, and Gary's group of eight climbing the northwest face. Below on the ground, reporters began swarming to the location, taking pictures and writing stories about the race that was taking place on the peak. Although it was a mountain rescue, it almost felt like a competition to see who would be the one to reach them first and claim the publicity. The rain had started back up 
but while it seemed to slow almost everyone down, it didn't slow down Francois. On August 20th, in the freezing rain, he would lead the expedition of eight to the Didra, an area 300 feet below Heinz and Hermann. It took Francois eight hours of climbing in an intense storm to reach the same area that it had taken the Germans over two days, and the other two groups of rescuers made little progress that day, meaning Gary and his group were the closest to the two men. As the sun began to drop, the men, soaking wet and shivering, would try to rest as best they could, but there was little anyone could do to ease the chill in their bones. As the sun rose over the horizon on August 21st, Gary began shouting up to Heinz and Herman, and almost immediately they responded. They told Gary that they were both fine, just hungry and cold. Obviously, this was a huge relief for the group of eight, and soon after hearing the news, they packed up their gear and began making their way up the final 300 feet. As Gary's rescue team made their way towards Heinz and Herman, the other rescue operations continued to make progress as well. On the summit, the rescue team enlisted some volunteer help, including Wolfgang Eigel, a friend of Heinz and Herman. Wolf Wolfgang's job was to rappel down to his friends to establish communication and help with the rescue, but as he descended, he lost his balance and twisted within the rope. The harder he fought to free himself, the more entangled he became. It only took a few seconds for Wolfgang to begin to panic. He was suspended below the summit, nowhere to go, and his rope was wrapped tightly around him. He continued to struggle and tried to wiggle his way out of the rope, but it became a noose and wrapped itself around his neck. It only took a minute, and he was gone. Wolfgang had strangled himself on accident, with his own climbing rope wrapped around him. The group of eight would receive news of the accident as they were closing in on the Germans, but because he was a friend of Heinz and Hermann, Gary decided to wait to tell them until they were off the mountain. So the group proceeded, as if nothing had happened. Around noon on August 21st, Francois and Gary would complete the final pitch, and reach the two Germans, a whole week after they had started their expedition. Apart from minor injuries, exhaustion, hunger, and freezing temperatures, the two men were fine, but the rescue was only half over. Now they had to repel two exhausted men over 900 meters down a slippery, vertical wall. Francois would later describe the descent. At that time, repelling down a 900 meter face was something enormous, and certainly for Rene and also for Gary, it was a question of pride. They wanted to keep the two Germans with them and not give them to the other team. As the men were on the ledge rigging the Germans with nylon harnesses, a helicopter flew overhead, snapping pictures of the entire ordeal. After a few minutes of preparation, the men would begin the descent, and for the next few hours, they slowly made progress down the rock face, while the media continued to document every second. As the sun began to set, the group would reach their bivouac Gary's team had used the night before, 300 feet below the ledge, and just as they settled in for the night, the rain would return, once again, soaking all the men. On August 22nd, the group of 10 spent the entire day descending the peak, and as the sun set, the men stepped on the glacier at the bottom of Petit Drew, soaked and exhausted, concluding the rescue. Over the next few days, camera crews would religiously follow Gary and the two Germans. In the black and white footage captured after the rescue, Gary appears tired. His pants are tattered and worn, and a red knit cap is perched at a perfect angle over his head. He laughs easily with the reporters, despite his fatigue. He loves the attention. But still, on the mountain, another rescue is taking place. A rescue with little to no media coverage. Rescuers would repel from the summit down to Wolfgang's body and cut him loose following the rescue of the two German men. From there, his body would be returned to his parents, who had traveled to Chamonix in grief. Because of the intense media coverage, Gary would be elevated to mythic proportions, while Rene would be left with a bitter taste in his mouth for the rest of his life. He always felt Gary received an unfair amount of credit for his rescue, even writing, Well done, Gary. Gary Hemming was the hero of the hour, the man who saved the two Germans, the man everybody wanted to touch and interview and see. You would have thought he had done the entire rescue single-handed. Nobody showed the slightest interest in the rest of us. Francois, the young Frenchman who had set the trail for the expedition, would state, Rene hid everything about the job we did. In all his books, he mentions the rescue, and each time his role grows, as if he'd done everything himself. I spent my life looking at what Rene was writing in his books and saying, bastard. He could have spoken a little bit more 
about my role. Many of the men on the rescue team would go on to become mountain guides across the world. Over the years, many of them would go on more impressive expeditions, and some would even lose their lives doing what they loved. However, the legacy of the 1966 Petit Drew Mountain Rescue would go down in history as the most watched mountaineering event of all time. Although the expedition was filled with controversy and animosity towards each other, at the end of the day, a team of eight men saved two lives and did it on one of the most challenging mountains in the world.